Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast with your host, Scott McMahon. Hey, fellow Film Troopers. Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast. As you heard, I'm your host, Scott McMahon. And today's episode is sponsored by the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion While Doing It. It's available in paperback, Kindle, and an audiobook. And in fact, you can actually get the audiobook for free when you sign up with audible.com for 30 days if you've never done it before. So get all the details at survivetheimplosion.com. That's survivetheimplosion.com. So today's episode is the first of a four-part series that I'm focusing on the craft of storytelling and trying to look at it in a different light than the standard sort of you know, screenwriting professors or people that come in that are teaching us about the narrative uh, constructs of writing scripts. Uh, In fact, today, my guest is Patrick Moreau of stillmotion.ca for Canada. But Patrick and his company, you know, started off with shooting wedding videos, then got noticed by the NFL and shot a bunch of films for the NFL that got noticed by CBS, then went on to win five Emmys, and then turned around and start making documentary films. So they have a different way of approaching the storytelling process because they're not necessarily writing a script and having actors perform them in a narrative construct. They actually have to acquire the footage, have to work with clients, but they are challenging themselves to find the best story. And in the process of doing this, they have developed a really unique storytelling system called Muse, which you'll hear about later on. Now, I first heard about Still Motion and Patrick because I stumbled upon this short film called My Utopia that they made, and it was just beautifully shot. It was tender. There was a sweetness, or as you'll hear Patrick say, a humanity to it. And then when I looked deeper into who made this film, I found it was a company right here in Portland, Portland, Oregon. So it's kind of funny, like, you know, you don't really know, like, all the wonderful things are happening in your city sometimes. So I was very excited to know that they were here locally. So uh, I wanted to get them on the podcast to just really talk about their film. But then all of a sudden, I started exploring more about how they constructed their company. And that's when I discovered they had this uh, educational uh, membership program around their storytelling process called Muse. Now, you have to understand, I got really excited by the way they've constructed this. Because here are independent filmmakers who are making the films they want to make these documentary stories and they're turning around and they're able to construct a business model around the education part of it and the education part of it is ex- extremely important for like almost every you know business out there because now they have this education portal it allows them to generate cash flow it's part of their business or one aspect of the business that they are you know expanding and growing and a lot of filmmakers i know that listen to this podcast are running their own type of production companies i mean most people to nowadays that are filmmakers are making their money because a client or an agency is hiring them to shoot web commercials, broadcast commercials, internal industrial videos, and so on. So the experience that Still Motion has gone through would be very uh, useful to many filmmakers out there that are going through the same thing. Now, as you'll hear in the interview, Patrick and his team took every step, every little win they had, and leveled up. So I actually met up with Patrick in person uh, near their offices, the new offices in Portland. And I just picked a restaurant. It was called My Father's Place. And it was just awful. (laughs) You know, a greasy dive bar. You you knew you were in trouble when I asked for, uh, you know, um, some fresh fruit. And they said, listen, all we have is some canned peaches. So (laughs) so Patrick and I, you know, muscled through the food. But you'll also hear, you know, some background noise and even some music kind of come in like halfway through the interview. And then I'll transition into an excerpt from a four part video series that Still Motion did with Vimeo. So Vimeo had the Vimeo school and they brought in Still Motion to teach their storytelling process uh, to the Vimeo community. So you're going to hear like uh, a little bit of the first video, an excerpt from that, which will give you an idea of what their Muse program is about. Obviously, their Muse program is much more fleshed out and they developed more on top of what they did initially a couple of years ago when they did the Vimeo school. So without further ado, here is my guest, Patrick Moreau of Still Motion here on the Film Trooper podcast. Uh, I was actually in university for psychology um, and it was like learning really fascinating things in psychology you know the studies on things like um, authority and all kinds of just really neat concepts and like these these things that you would have like the Stanford prison experiment or something like that 
and you'd see these unbelievable things that not many people knew about. And so I was always interested in trying to find a way to like bring some of that stuff to a wider audience, which kind of led me to the idea of documentaries. Um, and so that's where I met Amina, and we mm-hmm. started some motion together. Um, and we would just talk in psychology class about ideas and documentaries. And we, she was a photographer. Um, I'd never picked up a camera before. No interest in filmmaking. It was just like a, a means to being able to communicate. Um, and so I'd stay up late at night and learn about, you know, either she'd teach me aperture, shutter speed, ISO, like the technical side, or I'd be reading on steady cams and cameras to buy and how it all works. Um, but it was really just like a passion project born out of psychology. Fascinating, fascinating. Well, I, that almost makes sense it's looking at the, te- the work you guys do because it's like it definitely feels there's something deeper behind it. Mm-hmm. And so did, um, was like the documentaries you were making in school, uh, when did it lead to um, like doing weddings and then finding finding that kind of world well the funny thing is we never actually it took seven years to make the documentary that we got into it to do uh-huh. um, and it was somebody on Twitter that pointed it out that like oh isn't this why you guys started slow motion because um, it, it, it had taken so long and our path was so um, unexpected that we didn't even realize it um, weddings came as a result of my roommate in college his friend at work was getting married and uh, their photographer got sick the day before the wedding. No. And so no. he literally was like, my roommate, like, reads about this shit at, at night all the time. <laughs> like, maybe him, and, like, they might be interested, right? Yeah. And so, like, I literally bought and returned the camera from Best Buy that day. It was, like, a $500, like, high 8 camera, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, got that. Um, Amina had this all-in-one, like, Sony F707, like, really, you know, basic stuff. And it is it, I, it was not the best story ever. Um but we did it, and then we started getting more people calling and stuff like that, and, and that just kind of opened up the doorway of, huh, this could pay for the gear, and this could get us started. But we didn't really want to do weddings. We right, wanted right. to tell stories. We wanted to say something. So we were never trying to kind of conform to the industry. Yeah. And I think that's really what was the big difference, because we were just really trying to say something with our work and, and do something um, that was meaningful to the couple and hopefully to the world. Uh, I think that's why people like Canon or the NFL or CBS saw wedding work and said, there's something more to these people. Like, they could really help in, like, our stories, too. Yeah, because you had that one particular film, uh, the, the wedding that was shot in 7D, um, and, oh, drawing a blank again. The J.C. Nister? Yes, J.C. Nister. So then, seeing that trailer, what you guys put together, that was just went viral on, on Vimeo, was... <laughs> You could tell, like, oh, this is something deeper. But you said that was the particular film that the NFL came calling. Is yep. that correct? Yep. Yeah, that was the film that the NFL saw. And the irony of it is they were pre-production 7D cameras. We had two bodies, and it was we weren't even hired to shoot the wedding. Um, I was there to do a photographer promo for Justin and Mary, um, our friends. And it was because they had pre-production cameras, and there was a wedding. I was like, I offered to do it for the couple with no kind of... Uh, no promises, right? If it works, it works. Yeah, we're good. I want to make sure. <laughs> um, and and so because of that, I mean, I was there by myself. I had to cover a photographer promo as well as the wedding. And it sounds like a lot of restrictions, but it actually was very liberating because there was nothing I had to deliver. And I knew I couldn't cover everything. Hmm. And so all of a sudden I was like, well, what do I want to cover? And it was a very freeing experience because even when you're trying to tell a story or you've got creative control, you still worry about missing things and you worry about covering everything. But when you're there to do two different projects and you're by yourself with one person, you know, um, and, and because of that, it was very specific and intentional what I actually shot. And then the piece that came together, which was really, you know, it was just the three minute piece that went online and got hundreds of thousands of views. Um, but it, it, it said so much more because everything had a purpose. There was no room to just shoot just cause. Yeah, interesting. So that's, were you like a, like a member or just like a Vimeo in terms of putting stuff up there prior? Um, we had, yeah, I would, not really. You know, it, um, it, was a, it was a hosting platform that was better than YouTube. <laughs> You know, like yeah, yeah. at the time, right? Exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. It, but it, we didn't really see it as you. We didn't put it up with the intent that at the time we didn't even know things could go viral on Vimeo. Like we didn't know that there was even that kind of community and engagement, yeah. and like you know, n- not in the sense, and not th- that the NFL might see it and call us and actually hire us for work. Like that was totally off our radar. We would put it on Vimeo and then blog about it and just use that to embed it. You know, um, so it just totally caught us by surprise when all of a sudden. You know, got featured and the views go up, and we're getting calls from clients, and 
you know. What was that Philly like in terms of? Because I, I think it was great because you actually put in the the title Seven D, and I remember you know years ago that's whatever people were kind of searching for in Vimeo. I was like very sp- specific about cameras, and everyody mm-hmm. wanted to see the different examples. Like here's some test shoots or whatever. But this one was a self-contained story. It was emotional. It was you know it was really wonderful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it, it was actually the the NFL. The story that they told us long after we were working together and everything else is that. Uh, the lady who found us was actually doing exactly that. She was searching for 7D, right? So, like, the 5D had come out maybe a year before kind mm-hmm. of thing. Now the 7D was coming out, and they were looking for, you know, examples of it as thinking of, like, should they bring some in because they have their own network, the NFL network. Yeah. And so they were just searching for the technology. That led them to the piece. They saw all the views. They watched it and said, like, wow, these people know how to use the technology to actually tell a better story. It's not taking over, which is what they were seeing a lot at the time, right? Super shallow depth of field and sliders everywhere, and it wasn't that it was, like, story first. And so they were just really drawn by the story. And it's it's something that you kind of have to experience to understand. It's exactly what you see in the movie. Yeah. When, you, like, the phone calls and it says, like, the NFL. Right. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm good friends with uh, Ray Roman, the wedding filmmaker, mm-hmm. and he's the kind of guy that pulls, like, random shit and jokes on you all the time. And so I can remember when it happened, like, not wanting to bite, not wanting to, like, there's no way. Like, we're Canadians. We've got a different, our game is completely different. Like, yeah. it's a wedding, right? Like, it's just so bizarre. Um, so I almost dropped the phone, didn't know what to say. I'm trying to, like, figure, like, who the hell's pulling a prank on me? And then you're just, like, you, you talk to them for a couple minutes, like, oh, this is real. Like, you guys are actually going to fly us to a playoff game with no intent of airing it. It was just yeah. like, look, we're going to hire you guys, we're going to pay you, we'll fly a team down, we just want to see what you can do. Like, you show us what you can do, and if it works, then you've got a contract. But And that's why, honestly, the, your company just blows me away, because it's like, you, to me, you, what you have built and what you guys do is like the epitome of like the new uh, wave of like filmmaking entrepreneurs, or which is why I called mm-hmm. Film Trooper, Film Trooper. And so I was very excited just to, yeah. you know, to kind of dig into your, your story and to find out how you guys are doing that. Because from the outside perspective, I was looking at your trajectory and going, this is amazing and just so inspiring. And it's like, I want to like wrap it and go, every, I want to say, everybody, look, this mm. is a glowing mm. example of the new way of how as filmmakers can make the sustainable living to thrive and to, to be true to themselves artistically. I mean, you guys have really nailed it, and I, I was just, you know, definitely, definitely impressed. So, so well, we take this. You. So we take this journey. So you do the NFL gig, and you're not sure, but you guys have this innate talent. And did you, did you know, like, like the way you compose shots? The way when did it start um, seeping in that you had that maybe like, hey, maybe I kind of know what I'm doing. Not like you're, you're not ever humbly like. I, I, I still don't really think I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I know more than I did then, but I still feel like there's so much to figure out. And uh, I certainly don't think there was an innate talent. Um, it literally is like the 10,000 hours, hmm. not 100,000 hours. Uh, when I first got a steady cam, I would practice every single day. Like I would put it on and walk around the house and go for walks. And, you know, you just you don't hear or see about that. You just see that you get smooth shots. But um, it was a lot of trial and error. It was a lot of stuff that didn't work. Um, but it was the education side in getting into, after uh, Canon took one of our weddings, they turned into a national commercial for the T2i. So like Grey's Anatomy and House, like in shows like that on primetime, you're seeing our actual wedding footage advertising a T2i, right? So that was the first one. Then the NFL hires us for this several hundred thousand dollar contract. CBS comes along. And so like we're getting all of these major things happen and it created um, a strong influx of people asking for workshops. Like, how, how are you guys doing this? What's happening? Um, so we got into education. We started a, a hands-on workshop and that was massive in that it caused, it, it really brought to light everything we didn't know. We thought we knew what we were doing, but <laughs> every time we do a workshop and we couldn't explain something, we were driven to figure it out. Right, if we couldn't help you get to A to Z clearly, and there was some kind of gap of, well, why are we doing this? Or how does this work? Or you know, what is the difference between a steady cam shot and a slow push-in? Like, why do they feel different? Why are you choosing this one over that? And so we'd go and we'd, we'd learn. We'd watch movies, we'd read about it, we'd try and figure it out, and every single workshop would get deeper and stronger and you know, fill in some of those gaps. And uh, so that was one, the, the kind of, a whole other business side, like which is now another business of <laughs> still motion. Yeah. Um, 
but it was also the kind of driving force for I think our creative development more so than the work itself was the constant introspection in the educational context going why did we do this how do we make this better how do we explain every single frame and every single decision of every single composition because that's the kind of standard we're held to or those are the questions that come up right as soon as you teach composition anybody can look at any one of your films and say why'd you shoot that that way and what lens was that and what aperture and why <laughs> yeah yeah um, because that's what we were all that's what we were always about is like why and understand your decisions well that's what we became about we definitely had a phase where uh, we weren't <laughs> where it was much more effect over affect but mm -hmm. as we became more intentional then you need to understand everything you do and if you don't you figure it out you know you try and understand why you're doing those things um, and I think it was that process that has gotten us now 10 years later to be like this just hyper vigilant story for a studio that really just focuses on like what what does every single element decision say and how do we make them all point in the same direction what what's really stemming from that is like you it's like your interest in college with psychology there's a curiosity i think that's sort of this there's like a through line to everything you guys do so there's this sense of wonder or curiosity to want to know and then i love that you said like now that we're giving workshops the act of teaching allows you to force you to go i have to learn more or to get clarity uh, mm -hmm. i think it's fascinating so you've had 10 years to sort of re refine it and get uh, get it more honed so at what time did you guys decide to do uh, Stand With Me? Like, when did you want to, like, break away and go, yes, let's finally get, or let's finally do a, a documentary? Because yep. what I understand, it was supposed to be, like, a five-minute piece, but it turned yep. into something bigger. Yeah, um, there's kind of two storylines that converged okay. to make that happen. Um, the one was that we originally wanted to do documentaries, but then weddings took off and workshops came in, and then we kind of had those major inflection points of, you know, Canon, the NFL, and CBS. We won Emmys with our work with CBS, and just, like, everything changed. And if you kind of watch that journey, it kind of felt like, okay, so now it's time to try our own stories. You know, like, we've done all of this, and, and we still continue to do client work, and, and we love it, but um, it was like, okay, so now let's try and do this for ourselves. That's our next step. So it was in the back of our minds, um, and we were scouting two feature-length documentaries in Portland um, at the same time. Like we had storyboard, uh, we didn't have, we had plans, we had briefs, we were meeting people, we were talking about ideas. Um, and at the other storyline, the whole other side of it was that we had started doing pro bono pieces one a year. We would donate our time, um, just as our way of giving back. And uh, we felt that that did more than donating profits or money or anything else. And so the first one was Share, Old School Cafe. Um, it did really well, and it was a very um, powerful experience for us and those involved. And so the second one was going to be Lemonade. We heard of a story of a nine-year-old girl using lemonade to fight child slavery. Saw it in the Huffington Post. You know, wrote them an email out of the blue, told them who we were, what we were interested in, why we were, you know, what we were about. Um, set up a call, and I got off the call with Vivian, er, uh, Vivian's dad. Um, and I remember calling Grant, who was like literally in the field scouting two other documentaries at the time going like, this is it. <laughs> like, this is it. Cancel the other ones. Come on back. Like, you've got to hear. This is this is our movie. Um, we went down. We spent the weekend with them. And like, we, it was so much more. Like, this couldn't be a five minute piece. We were just like, this needs to be a full, a full film. Wow. Well, that just took you on a journey you didn't expect. I mean, I mean just watching it unfold. Uh, then how will you guys personally move from, like, did it, did it affect your art? Did it affect your, the way you were telling the story? Or did you, did you just feel like uh, beholden or responsible to try to capture the story as uh, honest as possible? Like, the, I don't know how much construction like, what was your process? In, in every story we do, we believe that you need to deeply understand if you're going to say something meaningful and lasting. Right, so you, we can't just walk in to a commercial or a wedding or a documentary sense and just start shooting if we expect to say something original and relevant. And so that meant that we had to start, like we were reading government reports, we were reading books on slavery, we were talking to experts, like we were making sure we understood the much broader story that was happening around this little girl before we would actually do our story. Um, so in that way, I really find that every story and especially, you know, the, the epitome of that is Stand With Me, you know, it fundamentally changes who you are and how you see the world because you go deep into these worlds. And in this one, it was objectification and child slavery. We were on the front lines, you know, with kids who were enslaved. And never is it more real, like, 
why stories matter, <laughs> you know, like why it's important to take this kid's experience and share it with people they don't know, because there's nothing else you can do. You can't bring him home. You can't just pay for his way out. Like there's nothing else you can do but try and get a culture shift and government shift and all kinds of other policies and ideas and much bigger action that needs to happen to stop these kinds of things. And that starts with stories and telling people. Um, and so, you know, we saw these things firsthand. We were in rehabilitation centers where girls were trafficked in Nepal, you know, just like really haunting things. But the humanity in all of it, the, the, the connection, how open and warm people were, you know, despite being through things that, you know, here we think that uh, we can't get cell reception and it's rough, yeah. you know, or clients mad at us because we, you know, they don't like the edit or we have too many revisions or we're behind and it can like be crushing for us. And, you know, you spend time with people that have really experienced extreme physical and emotional, you know, pain. And it just, it, it changes how you see everything. It changes your perspective. And it, um, I think it really inspires you and reminds you about the importance about what we all do, the, the how we spend our time. You know, and, and making sure that we, we do things that we're passionate about and hopefully are at the intersection of what we're passionate about and what the world needs, you know, in whatever way that is, you know. But um, I think that's really what we took away is it, it became less of an academic thing. We would always say that, you know, we believe stories can change the world. And, you know, we were these young kids who would wear our heart on our sleeve and, and we believed it. Um, but in the film, we lived it. Like, we actually lived it and we saw people become open to a new reality and moved and changed their own behavior. A girl in Ohio who saw the movie and started her own lemonade stand and got on the front page of her own paper and had her whole community coming out and donating money and creating impact yeah. as a result of this story. And so you see that kind of ripple effect as a result of what you're doing and you go like... It really does matter. So when did when you you also did a tour though of this particular film? So like when was that decision and like to road? Because what I saw was like you you did the road tour. You guys you said your company was always on the road, just traveling all the time, doing picking up the jobs, doing whatever needs to be done. So you were comfortably being on the road, I, I suppose. So now you have this film that needs to be promoted. Um, what was the thinking behind that? And also because I know that you eventually had a. Um, like that story tour later so it's like I could see where mm -hmm. you're, everything you guys do like you level up it's a natural progression uh, and then you like also the PlayStation had, gaming metaphor yeah um, <laughs> yeah you know we the original idea was that we'd make the film and then we would uh, <clears throat> get into Sundance and we would go and we'd sell it for a bunch of money and millions of people would see it and you know that kind of thing um, we didn't get into Sundance so that was the first thing uh, the, the way the delivery deadlines for you know the submissions entered, we um, we didn't have any of our international shoots in. We had a temp voiceover. We had all kinds of things. I mean, I can make all kinds of excuses, but it wasn't chosen. It wasn't good enough hmm. when we submitted it. Um, so that was out, and it, you know we were advised by some people that you know are very respected in the industry and the festival circuits that you know it, it was there. The film was there that if we kept submitting to other festivals, we would certainly get into one and, you know, we could play the game and it would be 12 to 18 months and we'd see something. They didn't guarantee how much we might get or whatever else, but that we could get viewership and we just couldn't do it. We couldn't wait because of everything that had happened. Yeah. Um, we kind of made our, we took our one shot with, with Sundance and it was like, we, we've got to get this in front of people just because of how real it was, right? Um, so we looked at platforms like Tug mm -hmm. that do, you mm -hmm. know, crowd tipping. Um, we bought out 30 theaters across North America and realizing that, you know, charging $10 a ticket, it's hard to pay for a team of people to crowd across the country. Yeah. We paired that with a workshop. Um, so we did a storytelling workshop where we taught uh, what is now Muse, our storytelling process. Um, but we basically showed people a step-by-step -step way of telling stories, used the film as an example, and then there'd be the premiere. Right, so it'd be two different events, and so we'd go, we'd, four of us in a minivan for 69 days, you know, <laughs> and we would go and we'd set up for a day-long workshop and, like, we'd set everything up and projectors and sound and everything, do that, and then go to the premiere and then drive to another city and, you know, did it for a couple months, and it was, it was amazing. It was incredibly <laughs> exhausting, but the people you meet and the... You know, and just the the diversity <laughs> yeah, of yeah. like you know teaching and sharing for a day, and then going out to a movie premiere and yeah, yeah. back and forth. <laughs> Amazing! I was uh, seventeen. I was a um, a roadie for my 
my buddy's ska reggae band. So this is like the summer right before my senior year in high school. And just the ability to travel around like in three months across the country, the United States, to see all the, 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 the interesting diversity of different towns, long stretches and cities. So that reminds me of like, the, what happens when you start the journey and where you guys end up is a whole other thing, so I can only imagine. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you, you hit you hit 30 days on the road and know that you're only halfway in, and it's it's really only the people that save you. You know, like showing up and getting people that are excited or seeing the reaction at the end of the movie, because it is hard when it hits 6 a.m. and you've got a eight-hour workshop and you've just done it 20 times. Yeah. You know, like, it is hard to kind of just find the energy. You're just so, so tired. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you really have to look for and and be grateful for all of those things to keep going because you just drown otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, let's talk about Muse because it's like, um, how did the you did this tour? You you got to the United Nations. You did this presentation. At what time at point did like Vimeo come in to do that sort of the initial like uh, storytelling school? Because I know you guys had that online yeah. and then. When did you guys decide to like make the switch to? Well, we we can actually sell this package, or we can create a membership around and what this our unique way of looking at story. Yeah, we. So, we had a relationship with Vimeo after all these things happened. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we we knew some folks there, and we, um, you know, would send them new stuff and that kind of thing. And so, out of that came the partnership to do a series called Storytelling the Still Motion Way a four-part tutorial series with Vimeo Video School. Um, And the creation of that is the very early, early version of Muse. Mm -hmm. It had the four pillars of story, people, places, plot, purpose. It just was super rough. It wasn't there. It didn't have the science and research, and it it had holes. Um, So we put that up. It went over really well, and people really enjoyed it. Uh, But then when we went to do the tour for the movie, it was like, what's the next level of this? How do we fill in all these gaps that it has and how do we make it about just the story because it was a mix of story and production for uh, Vimeo it was just like a weird mix of here's what you're looking for but then also like here's the production side and it was like let's just focus on the creative building of the story Um, and so then we started sketching out Muse and and hitting research journals and actually going like let's forget about let's realize that story is a human convention it's how we take our experience and share it with somebody else and see the world in a different way and so let's look at the science of human connection right like let's look at empathy how do we connect how do we how do how do i feel something and transmit that to you and if we can bring that into the fundamental mechanics of story well then you're getting you know a recipe that if i do x <laughs> the neurotransmitters in your brain will react like y and it will create this feeling you know and so like that's really kind of how we are how we continue to approach muse is is it's not it's certainly not still motion storytelling process mm-hmm. like it is a storytelling process that is based on science and and based you know field tested by our uh, by everything we've done and what we see out there and when you you know everything else but um, yeah, it's based on research and science and going, how do you break down story into its components, into its ingredients, and understand their role on your audience, on your viewer. Do you guys ever find yourself get, like having a moment just being excited, like, oh my gosh, wait a minute, this is how we started in psychology class in college, like this interest, again, this curiosity, and now you're like, I get to apply it. And, apply, and now we get to apply it the way, because it's interesting, because this whole, in the, in the world, the audience and I, that follow Film Trooper pretty much there. It's the usual screenwriting template. It's the narrative of here's your 120 page script or 90 page script, and, and there's so many different ver- variations of teaching that format, which is really fascinating because what you guys are offering and what you have worked on to craft and hone to create this uh, program and membership is that it's touching upon the documentary filmmaker, the one that has to deal with you know clients, uh, weddings. You know these are like real world applications of majority of the people that are making films that right now mm-hmm. with the cameras so i thought this is fascinating and uh, um how much uh, research did you get into like that that world of i don't know how many hundreds of like screenwriting books or something like that you, you know it's it's interesting because we've like we do focus on um non-fiction storytelling right D- documentary in whatever kind of sense that is or whatever kind of genre or format but you know we 
where we did our best work and where we built our our brand and reputation was you know clients like AT&T and Apple and Callaway and working with the best golfers or athletes or people like that where it was like these aren't actors we need to tell a real story and capture you know really powerful visuals as things are happening and keeping it relevant um and so that's that's how it started um as we looked at getting into like narrative um the 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 challenge is for us like the story is story you know a lot of people don't necessarily get that when they really like if you don't really deeply understand story as a human convention it really doesn't matter whether it's transmitted orally or visually or there's differences and um, there's ways that are more effective and less effective but uh, it's the same thing and certainly there's intricacies and complexities to a feature length script um, but the best stories transmit human truth right and and you look at some of the best screenwriters and best actors and what do they do they go live with real people like they learn from those that they're telling the story of they learn about the issue and everything else that's documentary like that's the same idea of like really telling a real story they're just creating it but the mechanics still apply right so the best documentary characters have the same traits as a hollywood character um or a you know a, a fictional character uh because it's based on reality and the same mechanics are at play um so it kind of it, 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 it takes a little bit more of thinking through the subject like to take muse and see the narrative application um but we have some like i have a ucla uh screenwriting graduate who does a ton of writing and he took the course and he's like oh my god i wonder i like i i realize why so many of my projects haven't worked like they're missing this element now i see how i need to build up my characters better you know um but what we don't do is show you how to actually like screenplay format or building yeah. out those things yeah. it's the structure and mechanics of story itself yeah it's fascinating i mean it's it's the evidence in the work too because i mean it's every piece that i saw when i was researching your company uh it was just it's just solid like it was in it was heartstrings and there's i mentioned to you in the, our first email together was like there's an inherent sweetness or inherent gentleness to your your work as collectively as a company and um and i mean that in a sense that um it doesn't feel like it's a like selling out it doesn't feel like there's a absence of you know soul there's a, definitely a soul in everything that i see that you guys are producing so um i think it, it's there's a humanity which yeah. you know when you say soul it's very synonymous but there's there's a humanity we always strive for a a deeper or higher truth like actually saying something um you know muse is based on the four pillars of story one of those pillars is purpose what do you actually say to the audience and whether it's a wedding film or it's a documentary or commercial piece we really try and make sure like what are we actually saying here that that hasn't been said that like it's going to stay with you um and that's what makes pieces memorable you know you can't remember an action movie most of us don't remember you know what happened in a mission impossible movie because it's so plot first it's action it just you know gets you physiologically going but it doesn't really touch you intellectually and it doesn't touch you in a deeper emotional way um so i think that's what it always is you know doing a super bowl piece for aunt jane and really talking about like legacy and commitment you know but you see these deeper themes that come through um in a very authentic way yeah fascinating so now you have your company who did you have like a business uh, background in terms of uh, the way you guys? Because <laughs> no, the way no, you guys have constructed it is is really just you know top rate, really fascinating. And oh, but just, thanks. It's certainly uh, it's not. <laughs> it hasn't always been run as well as it looks. Okay. <laughs> you know, we we didn't have business backgrounds. We're psychology students, um, and as we brought on other people, we were you know students, and we were learning, and we made a ton of mistakes about team building and you know how to be good leaders and profit margins and cash flow and we have made mistakes in all of those areas and um we are now at a place where we are much more aware and we're much more conscious um and that has come as a result of realizing that we will have a bigger impact if we harness business to scale what we're doing right we're not going to be able to reach the people we want and fund the projects we want unless we are smart about this yeah you know the first 7 years of our journey was just wearing a heart on a sleeve and going and doing things we go do a tour bring in 3 400,000 and spend 3 400,000 on it because we wanted to have the best experience possible and you know like we weren't going out and blowing it at bars at night we were just like 
buying amazing venues and making sure that it was unbelievable for people. But we'd come home and it wasn't really profitable. And uh, it was just because that wasn't that wasn't forefront. That's not what it was about, right? Yeah. We never got into this to make money. It was never the point. Um, but now we realize, obviously, that that's, that's how you grow. And if we want to have a much larger impact on how the world tells their stories and really empower you know, many different people to be more, uh, to be stronger storytellers, then we need to be aware of that. And it's been a huge overhaul in everything we've done in the past 24 months. You know, oh, wow. really so, watching yeah, yeah. everything, like knowing our profit margins on every project and our costs and our overhead. And, you know, we, we, we weren't nearly as aware as we should have been. Interesting. I want to see here. I want to Perfect. I wanted to wrap it up because I know that you guys have just launched so wrapped around what the muse program muse membership is it's a whole new education platform or uh, division of still motion and it's um tell me a little bit more about that yeah i I mean muse is a storytelling process based on the science of human connection it is a uh one-time lifetime membership so it's 497 us you get lifetime access uh it's an online platform that allows you to kind of see all the video tutorials, download audio recaps, get worksheets to apply the concepts, and it's all based on the four pillars of story. People, places, plot, purpose. Understanding the role of people in your film, of places, plot, that kind of thing, and then getting tangible tools to build them out from A to Z. Um, And it's about telling your own story in whatever story it is, but it gives you a reliable and repeatable process for being able to do that. And... um, but I think what really, there's two things that really make it special for me. One is the amount of research that goes into it. That comes across in an entertaining, fun way. Um, but that it's really, it's not just us going, hey, this worked for us, check it out. It's like, you know, it's looking at um, going much deeper. And we're working with, you know, some of the leading authors in story. Um, Annette Simmons, who has, you know, some amazing books on story. And uh, Paul Zak, the leading uh, neuroscientist in story. Like, how our brain reacts to story. And, you know, working with these people and getting them to go inside our course and give us feedback and make sure everything is as strong as it can be. Um, That's one of it. And the other one is that our true desire is to empower other people to tell better stories. Because we know that we can only do so much ourselves, right? Uh, We can do so much more if we can help other people be more intentional and tell more moving stories. And so everything we've done is designed to help maximize learner outcomes is what we say um, but maximize success which means you don't just log in and then you're you're done and like you never see us again yeah. we've got all kinds of support systems we will mail you all the content in a printed physical book you get a canvas poster to see the process um, we'll check in with you we'll follow up like we genuinely want to make sure that you get the support to also learn the process because the problem is a lot of us sign up for online training we start it and we never finish it because we can come back anytime um, so that actually is just as big a part of it is we want to support you in learning and if you've got roadblocks you know, we have two full-time team members that their role is just supporting learners, reaching out, asking questions, being there to support. We've got an instant chat inside the course so that you can like reach out at any time. Uh, and that's been huge to make sure that it really is this like transformative shift in how you see story and then how you're able to apply it to what you do. In this first segment, we'll be sharing what we call the four P's of storytelling. Why? Because these are the fundamentals, the building blocks that are consistent among any film we create. When we first started telling stories, we would just show up, try to figure out things on the fly, and do our best to keep up. Later, we'd pull the footage into post and spend hours trying to piece together and find a coherent story. We'd look back and say, I wish I knew their vows were going to be that emotional. I wish I'd known I could have shot in that location. If I'd only known, I would have shot it so differently. Eventually, we got fed up with always being one step behind, and we asked ourselves, what is it? that really makes a great story? What elements of a story do we look for every time we go out and shoot, regardless of the project? And how can we plan for and lock in these things to ensure that we stay a step ahead and not a step behind? We didn't get all of our answers at once, but over the years we've developed a process for telling stories that has allowed us to stay ahead, remain flexible, and share some amazing work with the world. The first step these days in any story we take on or tell is to ensure we have a firm understanding of each of the four P's. First, people. Who is in our story? Next, we have places. Where does our story take place? And then we have plot. What is the conflict and the journey? And the fourth one, 
purpose. Why should anyone care about this? It sounds simple, but our focus on these four fundamentals, even before we pick up a camera, has revolutionized the way we tell stories. Let's break down each one of these on their own. The people in your films are your characters. The primary job of our characters is to make us care about the story, make us relate to the story, make us emotionally invested in the story. We want to root for our characters. We want them to succeed or triumph. Well, unless we want to flip the script. A good antagonist can have us rooting against them, wanting them to lose, or screaming at our screens in anger. Good or bad, the people of your film will bring your audience into the story. However, there are two tricks we've learned when it comes to characters. First, your characters may not always be a real person. It could even be an object. When we shoot a wedding, it's really easy to fall into the trap of assuming that the bride and groom will always be our main characters. In the case of Veronica and Dan, we actually had a third character, their wedding day vehicle. It was a 1970s Winnebago. It was rusty, creaky, and best of all, it was them. We made it a big focus of their film because we knew its backstory and how big a character it is in their life together. By spending so much time covering the Winnebago throughout the day, we get a really original character that helps to connect our audience and draw them into the story. The second trick we've learned about characters is to look deeper than just the first person that is given to us. Sometimes your best characters aren't the obvious ones. Several years ago, we filmed a series of spots for Callaway Golf, featuring their top PGA golfers, one of which was Phil Mickelson. As we were doing our research on Phil, we found out that his caddy, Bones, had been with him for a long, long time and played a huge role in Phil's success. As a result, Bones was flown in just to take part in this shoot, and our interview of him ended up playing a key role in Phil's eventual spot. When it comes to your characters, the number one thing to remember is that you are the filmmaker. You are the one that gets to choose your characters. So get creative and dig deep. The places in your films are where your story happens. Locations have the potential to add depth and intrigue to your characters and your stories. They can also help us visually communicate a great deal of information in a short amount of time. And on the negative side, a bad location can completely disconnect us out of a scene or character. So it's critical that we give the places in our film a good deal of thought and importance. Whenever we look for the perfect location, we consider these three characteristics. First, relevance. Does it fit or relate to either our character or our overall story? Second, comfort. Will our characters feel at ease? Will the people on screen be able to act naturally? And third, production friendly. Do we have enough space? How much lighting will we need? How loud or controllable is the sound? Who may be in the way? I can remember when we were on the road traveling for our documentary, I'm Fine Things. We met up with a lady named Tammy who had downsized her life and moved into a 150 square foot tiny house. We knew we wanted to include her story and her journey to lead a more simple life, but we were unsure where to shoot the interview. Her home was, as you can imagine, tiny, so we had very limited space inside. We could have moved it outside, but we may have had problems with shifting light and uncontrollable audio. Ultimately, we chose to shoot it inside, but up in her loft, which would mean holding the monopod against the actual ladder to get the shot. While it wasn't the most production friendly, it was extremely relevant to her topic and Tammy's favorite spot in her whole home. When it comes to location, oftentimes we have a tendency to settle on what is easy or what is given to us. Don't do that. Dig deep to pick locations that have relevance, comfort, and are production friendly. Even when you're given a location you can't control, push yourself to make the most of each and every space in your film. Now the plot is where we build intrigue for the viewer. It's the journey we take our audience on. It's the conflict our characters confront. You have no idea how many times we ask ourselves around the studio, hey, what's the conflict of this piece? Who's the enemy? This is what separates a fluff piece from a true compelling story. Even if you're given the task of shooting a car commercial, we believe that finding the conflict, the struggle, the tension, will craft that commercial into a masterpiece that hooks the viewer from start to finish. We encourage that you have a conflict in every story you tell. Now that doesn't mean you need to have a villain in each piece. And it doesn't mean every piece has to be a tear-jerking drama. 
conflict or tension can come in all shapes and sizes. Even weddings need conflict. In the case of Stu and Dana, Stu had committed to memorizing his custom written vows. He was nervous and he wasn't sure if he could. We made this extra bit of tension a focus as he practiced all morning and afternoon. As he paced around the room while committing his lines to memory, the viewer feels more empathy and starts feeling nervous with him. By the time the ceremony arrives, we're really rooting for him. And when he delivers them through the tears he tries to hold back, we feel more connected to him than ever and largely because we, as the viewer, have seen him work through this conflict. The reason the journey and conflict are so important is that they leave your audience asking questions. They engage their curiosity. As soon as your audience has no unanswered questions, and as soon as they start to find the plot predictable, they'll tune you out. They'll move on. Focus on your journey, your conflict, and constantly remind yourself to generate questions that'll keep your audience intrigued and will leave them wanting to watch until the end. Why? It may be the most used word in all of still motion. Why is anyone gonna care about your film? Why are you telling this story? What is the essence, the purpose, the meaning of what you're doing? Here's how we like to think of it. Know what you need to say before you speak. Your film will carry more impact, your stories will resonate with more people, and you'll save time, stress, and money. For example, we knew that we wanted to take on the issue of how people got trapped in complacent lives and careers and inspire those people to take back control over the direction of their lives. But we also realized that we wouldn't be able to solve every problem for every person. This issue is complex and has no one-size-fits-all magic bullet that's going to work for everyone. So instead, we decided we just wanted to open the door to show people examples of other people who've confronted this issue head-on and by doing that, push them to take action for whatever their dream may be. We were able to focus all of our energy on a clear, succinct purpose. And that was to make a film that challenged people to reclaim their dreams. We wanted to be that spark, the catalyst that helped people make a change to live a life more aligned with their passions and their purpose. When filming your own documentary, like Baker and Grant did, knowing your purpose or your why might come more naturally. After all, it's your documentary. But what about the times you're hired for a specific commercial gig? Aren't things out of your control? No, don't give yourself that excuse. Treat every commercial job with the same passion you put into your own projects. Keep pushing for that why behind what you're doing. Pulse is a film we created about BioBeats, an iPhone app that turns your heartbeat into music. They'd come to us originally to make a simple Kickstarter video. But after meeting with them and seeing just how passionate they are and the reasons why BioBeats exists, we shared with them a vision of a film that spoke to a much larger concept, something more than just seeking out financing. It involved many shoot days, international travel, and a schedule that nearly killed everybody involved in the project. But in the end, we were able to share this vision for a film that needed to be made. They now have an incredible film that speaks to the who and what of BioBeats, but much more importantly, speaks to the reason why they do what they do. Whether you're creating something on your own or you're hired to produce a specific film, we challenge you to be able to state your purpose in one clear, succinct sentence. Until you can do that, don't even pick up a camera. What's the purpose of your film in one sentence? No matter what project we tackle these days, we start right here with the fundamentals. Who are the people in our film? What places will add depth and intrigue? What journey will we take them on in our plot? And what's the purpose for telling this story? Get used to the four Ps we've outlined today and your storytelling will thank you. And that concludes my interview with Patrick Moreau of stillmotion.ca, uh, as well as their new division called learnstory.org, where you can learn all about their Muse uh, membership, the Muse program. And I'll have more information on the show notes over at filmtrooper.com forward slash 102, because this is uh, episode number 102 of the podcast. Again, that's at filmtrooper.com forward slash 102. Now, if you like the podcast, think about leaving a ratings review on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, and it's also available on Google Play for anyone who's not on the iOS devices, uh, there's, since there's a lot of people that listen to podcasts on their Android. And speaking of ratings and review, I would like to thank 
um, both uh, Beekman Street and Kyle at Backyard Space Opera for leaving a five-star rating and review for me on iTunes. But that's not it because we don't want you to leave empty-handed if you are stuck trying to make your film uh, this year. I invite you to go over to freegearguide.com to get an equipment list of everything I use to make a feature film with no crew over at freegearguide.com. Again, that's freegearguide.com. Thanks for sticking around and listening, and I hope you enjoy the next three episodes that are focusing on story, as uh, this year I'm trying to do more series, so it'd be like... Uh, Next month will be a different series on a different topic and bringing different guests to focus on those types of things. So I want to thank you again for supporting Film Trooper and have a good day. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Film Trooper, filmmaking freedom for the independent.